and watching that. Um, so the next couple of slides uh, will we'll look at uh, demand specifically for lamb. This first one will be consumption uh, and the second one will be price. So remember that that demand is truly a function of, of consumption and price, not just, not just consumption. Um, you can see that we are projecting a decrease in consumption this year in 2020, um, but that should rebound uh, in 2021. So um, hopefully the issues with COVID-19 are, you know, this is assuming that they are relatively short-lived and that things will proceed closer to normal uh, moving forward. Um, and so, so we'll definitely see that hit this year, um, but expect to see a, a slight rebound again then in 2021. So that's the consumption side of demand. If we look at the price side of demand, um, you know, demand still relatively strong right now because of these, the, these prices. So, you know, uh, wholesale price, um, our national lamb cutout value uh, still significantly above the five-year average. So this solid red line here is the 2014 to 18 uh, average. The dotted line is 2019, and this solid blue line is is the 2020 numbers. And you can see that we're still trading uh, significantly above that that five-year average in terms of of price. So uh, consumption has gone down slightly, but we're still, we're still up there in price in terms of strength of demand um, as we think about that moving forward. Just a bit of a summary on demand. You know, how many negative quarters will we see in the GDP? Certainly we have to uh, be aware of that and, and keep our eye on that. And how long will it take to build back consumer confidence? Um, is it gonna be a, a rapid build back if, if things uh, return uh, closer to normal this summer, or will we see a slower build back? So definitely uh, something to keep in mind and, and keep an eye on as you're thinking about your marketing plans later this year with, with LAM. Uh, consumption projected to decline in 2020, uh, but then rebound there in 2021, and wholesale price still relatively strong right now. So that's the demand side. We'll look at the supply side. Um, Certainly many of you are familiar with this chart. This is Britain use one year and older as of January 1. Um, you know, if we look at it over a long period of time, it's a fairly steep uh, downward curve there for a while. But if we look at it really from 2014 through 2020, really uh, we've seen a flattening out of that, of that decline and, and in the last couple of years even flatter. Um, so, really slight declines, but, but really starting to find the bottom of that U inventory right now, I think. So um, this chart, definitely one of the impacts on this supply side is our slaughter uh, capabilities and current slaughter. Uh, you can see that we are down uh, fairly significantly, um, about 10,000 head, uh, weekly on average um, from from you know up here at at 41 uh, to a little below that uh, we had a little bit of a bounce back last week and and then a little bit of up and down here in slaughter but definitely uh, slaughter has been affected now not all of this was due to COVID-19 much of it still is um, but there were some issues with uh, within the industry in terms of of plants transitioning uh, and plants uh, expected to come online. And so some of that is reflected in that, uh, but certainly uh, there are, you know, some reports of, of labor issues and uh, issues with COVID-19 in, in lamb plants as well. They're not, they're not immune to it. Uh, you know, we're seeing some of the, we're hearing some similar issues that we hear uh, on the beef side and pork side in terms of plants struggling with those, with those workers. Now, um, those plants have been uh, received a directive uh, to stay open, um, but there's still a challenge in terms of, of keeping workers healthy and keeping uh, that process moving through. So uh, definitely seeing that effect on, on slaughter. Now the next few slides, you'll see that we're, you know, they're not necessarily 
uh, well, they're lagging behind a little bit. So if we look at U.S. lamb imports, um, pretty close to the five-year average, um, but we don't, you know, we're, we're a couple of months behind on, on that uh, data, but pretty much uh, pretty close to the five-year average, not reflecting yet any changes. Um, Colorado lambs on feed, uh, starting an uptick, but definitely May and June will be interesting uh, as we as we watch this to see if um, we start to back lambs up in the feedlot um, versus with a with a reduced number in slaughter. Uh, but certainly this this chart still lagging a little bit behind in terms of being able to tell us the real picture uh, based on those uh, slaughter uh, numbers as well as dressed weight. So you know right now. Uh, we're below that five-year average in terms of dressed weight. Uh, you would expect that as, as lambs get backed up in the feedlot with reduction in slaughter um, for those dressed weights to climb up, um, which isn't, isn't necessarily a good thing for the industry. Uh, here in just a second, uh, either this slide or next slide, we'll share some um, data from a previous time when the industry was backed up and we, and we started to, to increase these dressed weights. Um, but like, like I said, this one also lagging behind, uh, and we'll have to be uh, watching this through April and May to really understand uh, the impacts of the, the reduced slaughter uh, numbers. And then the final one that I'll show here before I turn it over to Whit for just a couple of seconds and then back into me uh, is this lamb and mutton and cold storage. So again, uh, this the cold storage numbers haven't really started to pull down yet, um, and we'll we'll have to watch that uh, through April and May, uh, well, through the April report and May uh, numbers to see how much cold storage is pulled down um, as a result of of uh, fewer uh, numbers of of uh, slaughtered animals. So, with that, Wit was going to share just a couple of slides here on the impacts of, of slowing this process down uh, from uh, some information from, I think, 2008. Is that right, Whit? Got to unmute yourself. I'd, I'd, I'd keep talking, and you'd probably be better off. Uh, so this came from actually 2018, some survey data that we've been working on in some of the Intermountain West plants. And again, just thinking about those Colorado feedlot inventories and keeping an eye on those dressed weights. Um, obviously, we're worried about just staying current first and foremost, but I think in the back of our minds, we should probably be aware of, of some of the consequences of being backlogged. I have yet to meet anyone who really loves chewing on lamb fat. I, I'm looking forward to that day. That'll be an interesting conversation. But as we, as we produce more yield grade fours and fives, is that distribution increases in those quantity of those carcass types, we see a lot more um, issues related to fat. So this is just a snapshot from that 2018 season when we had some plant malfunctions and we were short on our ability to kill things in a timely manner. I share both of those USDA yield grades, which is what is primarily reported out of our plants, but also the calculated yield grade, which comes from that 12th rib back fat um, calculation. And, and again, it just, it, it provokes some thought of how many of, of those extremely fat carcasses are lumped into four and five categories. And uh, you know, how, how the producer is, uh, um, the processor is clearly challenged with having to deal with uh, where to put those and how to process those, those cuts and, and how they mitigate the fat is, is, is pretty much up to them. And um, you know, I think quality is a concern. Go ahead and go to the next slide, Bridger. You know, obviously, as we increase from yield grade one to yield grade five, uh, we see a greater composition of fat content. Uh, there's some good, those bar graphs on the left-hand side there actually come from some good work out of CSU in 2011. Uh, to my knowledge, it hasn't been published yet, but still, it shows various cuts in the effects of increasing yield grades on the percentage of fat. Click it one more time, would you, Bridger? And then those are some of the images from, that we captured uh, in the plant. And again, the image on the bottom clearly is, is a lamb that has uh, gone beyond its, its ideal finish weight. Uh, the one on the top, uh, probably more ideal. Uh, but again, just thinking about those cuts and the product we produce, fat from a yield grade two based off these estimates from Netto, uh, if we were to eat a rack of lamb, 
um, yield grade two, it'd be about 32% fat. Click it one more time, or actually twice, Bridger. And then a significant increase is we produce a rack that's a yield grade four. Um, obviously, we can trim some of that off and we could mitigate it, but in those shoulder cuts and some of the leg, uh, that's a little harder to mitigate. And so I, I, I just, I pose a question, what, what rack do you want in your table? And so as we think about the consequences of backlog, this has been on my mind. Back to you, Bridger. All right, so certainly, you know, uh, we'll kind of foreshadow some things that we'll talk about later, but, you know, maybe extending those lambs out before they get to the feedlot uh, is a better strategy for uh, dealing, uh, so that we're not dealing with meat quality issues uh, versus uh, backing them up in the feedlot. So um, this chart uh, represents commercial lamb and mutton production. Uh, so you can see that in quarter one of 2020, uh, we are significantly below uh, 2019 project or 2019 numbers. And then quarter two will also be projected to be below uh, 2019 slaughter numbers. In later in quarter three and quarter four, those are projected to, to catch up and be and will be slaughtering uh, more animals or harvesting more animals um, than, they, than we were in 2019. So just kind of a summary of supply. You inventory decline is slowed to, to nearly level. Uh, slaughter is sharply lower due to several complicating factors in the industry. Uh, mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, plant transitions as well as um, uh, COVID-19 issues with employees. Uh, dressed weights and cold storage not yet reflecting those slow slow down in slaughter, and then lamb and mutton production projected, projected to catch up in, in quarter three and quarter four. If we look at feeder lamb prices, the three market average uh, from uh, on the weekly basis, you can see April, um, we had a, a significant uh, downturn there at the first of April, uh, and then, uh, you know, two weeks of, of really, uh, depressed prices. Uh, we've seen a bounce back this last week. Um, certainly, I would expect to see quite a bit of price volatility uh, as we move forward uh, in the lamb market. And, and, you know, that'll be another thing that we want to talk about really is, is being flexible enough to take advantage of some of that volatility is going to be key for, for some of our producers. Um, and so thinking about ways you can take advantage of that as a, as a producer uh, might be really helpful. Um, so that's, that's where we've been. Where are we going? Um, this is current uh, LMIC uh, Livestock Marketing Information uh, Center forecast. Um, these numbers were updated just yesterday. So this is, uh, this is as, as close to current as we can get. Um, and you can see projections from quarter two through quarter four uh, for that feeder lamb, three market average, 60 to 90 pound, uh, 60 to 90 pound lamb. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, some uh, price decline through through this year, um, but uh, if things um, continue to go as planned anyway with COVID-19, uh, we'll see that bounce back in, in uh, 2021. So the question is, should you buy time? You know, traditional dynamics within the, within the lamb industry. Uh, I'll show you a chart here in just a second, uh, comparing a 75 pound lamb versus a hundred pound lamb. Uh, and then we'll also look at some seasonality differences between September, November, and February. Uh, but in general, you know, even in a, in a sort of a, a, a traditional market, uh, there, there are some market incentives uh, for producing uh, lambs a little heavier and market incentives for producing uh, lambs that you can deliver uh, later, you know, either November or February type deliveries. Uh, will those dynamics hold this year? Well, that's, you know, it's a good question as we look in, as we look forward. Certainly that's the way uh, those project, uh, lambs are projected. Um, but if everyone delays lambs, what will it look like? So one of the one of the best producer panels I ever listened to, uh, a producer was, was talking about some strategies that he was doing um, 
as a panelist and he went through all of his strategies and and he was getting grilled pretty heavily by by the rest of the producers in the crowd afterwards uh and they were asking him a bunch of questions and he said hey look you know the strategies that i'm sharing with you absolutely work they work for us he's like but i really hope that none of you listen to me because then my profit margin will remain high right so um so the point is that you have to be flexible in your plan this year uh, and certainly, you know, the lamb market is, is thin enough that, that um, you know, if you, if you see major shifts, um, that can certainly impact uh, the overall market. So it's not necessarily the best thing to do what everyone else is doing every year, but really look for those marketing windows and, and be flexible um, and really try and, and be resourceful with your own resources uh, to be able to mark those lambs when when they're sort of scarcest and needed the most within the market. So I told you I would show you a couple of charts. Uh, this is the three-year average prices at Sioux Falls. Um, you can see a 60 to 90 pound averaged at a 188. Um, so a total value of $141.37. And then that 90 to 110 pounder uh, in there at 168. Uh, so a total value of 168.20 on 100 pound lamb. So, you know, that's a cost production margin of 2647. If you can if you can put those that extra weight on them from a 75 pound to a 100 pound lamb for less than the 2647, uh, the market is is giving you an incentive uh, right now, uh, or at least traditionally um, on average to, to move those lambs uh, up in weight. So there are there are some incentives for for being able to hold lambs and put a little extra weight on them from a weight perspective. And then if we look at it from a seasonal price index, uh, certainly, you know, be a little cautious on in terms of uh, this year, the index uh, could be, you know, uh, well, it will be different than the average. Uh, no year is, is equal to the average, but, um, but definitely keep an eye on that. Uh, right now it's projected to, to see similar sorts of rebounds though. So on average though, uh, over the long time, all over the long term, when you in, when you go from an August September marketing, so in here marketing uh, to a February marketing, you see about a 23% increase in price. And even moving that from an August September marketing to a November marketing, we see a you know a modest 5% increase in in that market price. So there are some incentives again in the marketplace to think about. Uh, ways to deliver lambs at, at different times than, than that standard time. Uh, that can vary a little bit uh, across regions. I know that we have folks from, from all regions with us. Um, so, so you have to think about that as well. But, but definitely there are some incentives there and, and whether your resources match up to that or not is, is really the, the question. So uh, Witt's going to share some examples with you. He's going, he used this uh, calculator on the Wyoming Ranch Tools website, uh, the break-even budget calculator, uh, to run some scenarios for you, uh, some scenarios that he'd been thinking about uh, and that we've talked about and, and discussed. So um, the way this break-even budget looks like, uh, so, you know, what's going to share um, some averages that, that, he, that he's seen and, and what you might be able to expect, uh, probably worth your time if you're really thinking about uh, making some of these changes to go ahead and put your own numbers in here uh, to really get a, a good answer. But you enter your additional costs in this, in this column. Um, if you're gonna be extended lambs out, you, you enter in the initial weight, you know, number of head and the, the market price that you would expect on those 75 pound lambs say, and then if you're gonna try and put some weight on them, you know, maybe market them in, in November as, as 90 pound lambs, uh, you would enter in the, the final weight and the projected number of head accounting for death loss. And it gives you a break even price on those lambs to help you analyze whether a strategy like this might, might work out for you. So that's really it for my portion. Um, I'll, you know, if you have uh, sort of outlook questions, uh, I'll take those at the end uh, with, with Witt and, and everyone else. Um, I'm gonna turn the time over now to Witt. Um, to go ahead and finish this out and, and talk about some of the strategies that, that he's, he's been developing to, to manage this process.
Okay. Thank you, Bridger, for, for sharing those, those insights. Um, again, I'm, I'm just going to walk through a couple of scenarios. Can everyone see my screen? Someone tell me they can see their, my screen. Yes, we can see your screen. All right, and you can clearly hear me. So uh, I, I think these, these tools that, that Bridger alluded to are, are extremely helpful, especially during this time of unknown. Uh, I think one thing that is timeless is the, the keeping our eye on our input costs uh, and, and what our break-evens are. And so I'm going to walk through a couple of scenarios. But before I do that, I think what's really important, again, we're going to focus on the scenario of just extending our lambs for a short period of time uh, to, to capitalize on those, those seasonal increases by hanging on to them a little bit longer. Clearly, I understand every operation is different. And as we go through these scenarios, you, it's extremely important that you utilize your own values. And uh, a lot of these I've taken from visiting with producers in the uh, Wyoming and Montana regions. But, but obviously, some of these resources, um, we can get a baseline estimate from various um, published resources out there. Uh, an important first component to this is determining what our feed costs are. No matter what your operation is, we know feed costs represent a majority of our our variable costs. And so um, a good starting point or is knowing where to find some baseline estimates as to what grazing fees or dormant pasture uh, cost us. Uh, one of those estimates comes from USDA NAS. Um, I'm not sure when the next one will come out, but January 2020, that image on the left shows AUMs or the amount of uh, forage required to maintain a cow for one month. We would divide that value by five to get our per head per month value for sheep. Now, the, the limitation with that database and those, those numbers are that those are what are reported by producers. And so uh, they're as good as the accuracy of what's being reported. So I'll leave that one alone. But uh, BLM and, and our federal uh, grazing uh, fees are a little bit more straightforward. Uh, the 2020 fee was $1.35 per animal unit. Again, if you do the math there, that, that comes out to be about 27 cents per head per month, um, a pretty cost-effective source. But, but those of us from other parts of the re uh, country, I noticed in the poll that over half of us are from areas outside of the Mountain West. Uh, a good consideration is, is, is what crop residue or cover crop is valued at. Um, taking advantage of, of opportunities with, with hailed out row crops or, or pulse crops in the northern uh, plain states provide an excellent opportunity to extend some lambs on a pretty uh, nutritious diet. And then there's, there's, of course, perhaps the least cost scenario, which again might be the most feasible for some parts of the country, is, is dry lotting our sheep or, or providing uh, their entire diet to them instead of letting them harvest it themselves. But the point of this is just it's really important for us to, to quantify what those costs would be. And especially now as we look ahead to the fall and extending lambs. So now I'm going to move into a scenario that is a break-even scenario. And again, it doesn't fit everybody, but it provides how, how I've worked through this exercise. And uh, I'd encourage many of you to reach out to your extension resources to work through some of these break-even scenarios as well. I'm not an economist, and it's probably going to show as I walk through this, but uh, let's just take a scenario of a 70 pound feeder lamb, uh, normally marketed in August, but we're going to hang on to it to November 1st. So about 92 extra days. And I broke this table, as you see the first column that says feeding strategy, I tried to capture some of the, the ranges and what we would see in these various scenarios. More, more relevant to Wyoming and the Northern Plains states, but we've got winter range, which is perhaps the lowest input scenario. I'm not necessarily advocating for that, but in Wyoming, we enjoy a pretty diverse uh, uh, landscape in terms of uh, plant diversity, and those provide some pretty valuable nutrients during critical times of the year. And so utilizing winter range or, or turning on its head how we look at utilizing our winter range, instead of just using it for use, that might be an opportunity. For some of us, winter range plus a supplement is the most feasible scenario, especially in Wyoming. Uh, and then I provide a cover crop and a dry lot. That next column that says ex performance expected, that's a pretty important component to a break-even analysis. If we're gonna hold that lamb for an additional 92 days, clearly an important strategy that we have to keep in mind is, is the cost of the weight that we're putting on those lambs, but also the performance. And so I provided some estimates based off the literature. Again, winter range, uh, we'd be looking um, 
in a really good winter range at, at a tenth of a pound, maybe a little bit more. Um, winter range plus supplement, maybe a quarter pound average daily gain, cover crop residue, three tenths of a pound, and then a dry lot. Again, thinking that we're extending the lambs and growing them a little bit more moderately on a roughage diet uh, would range anywhere from three tenths to five tenths of a pound. That third column there says feed cost per head per day. Again, to do that, I, I calculated uh, into those um, scenarios what your grazing fees would be in those costs. I provide the initial weight and the final weight. And again, you can see that those are different. Uh, again, depending on the inputs that, that work for you, and, and in this break-even analysis, it's important to account for what kind of weight gain or predict what kind of weight gain we, we may be experiencing. Then we, we combine those costs to 92 days, we sum those up, and you can see that the winter range is about $2.15 for those 92 days. Again, an extremely low cost scenario, um, 16 cents for the winter range plus supplement, or I'm sorry, $16.80 for the winter range plus the supplement strategy, $21.40 for the cover crop residue, and then the highest input, $42.60 in the dry lot scenario. Uh, it's important to understand, as the footnotes show at the bottom there, in this scenario, I don't include herder costs. Many of us in the Intermountain West utilize H2A herders, and again, um, you could add $1.78 to those costs if we divided out the monthly fees uh, monthly salary of those herders, um, and so that would change things. But let's talk about the break-even a little bit and how I approach this. You know, I, I think in a in an ideal scenario, we'd never lose a lamb, but we we know that that sheep do die, and we don't always have control over predation issues in, in our areas. But uh, you can see that the break-even that's what it costs us um, to to not lose any money and obviously not make any money. That's our starting point. So. I provide the low based off those LMIC uh, seasonal indexes, based off the three market average. Uh, to calculate that, I went back to historic LMIC prices, uh, five-year prices, multiplied those by those seasonal averages, and it kind of gave us um, some, some break-even prices there uh, for the forecast. Uh, What's, what's important to keep in mind with these is, is the uncertainty of this, this year in an unprecedented time um, the low average and high scenarios, I think I'd be wanting to look more at the low break-even scenario. I don't want to be a pessimist, but the reality is, is uh, we don't know how markets are going to rebound, and, and they very well could change from our predictions pretty abruptly. Um, and so that dollar five at the winter range um, break-even cost, you can see that uh, if I get a dollar five, I'm not going to lose my shirt, but I'm sure not going to pay the bills necessarily. Uh, going up, I'm sorry, um, that's with no death loss. If we experience a 10% death loss, you can see that break even with 10% death loss. Again, looking at worst case scenario, our break even would probably be $1.16. As, as we work into those scenarios, the cover crop residue and the dry lot, I do have to mention that these break even scenarios and these forecasted prices that I provide in this particular example uh, are based off that 60 to 90 pound range. And, and so that's really the sweet spot. Bridger alluded to the point that we do see the seasonal increase. It's about 5% from August to November historically, may not be that this year. It's about 23% when we go from uh, August to February. But the reality is, is, is as those lambs get heavier um, and we are ramping up for an Easter market, um, oftentimes too much weight if we're trying to play this game of, of hitting the increase, uh, heavier lambs may not be desirable. It depends on when we're selling them. The point is, is this exercise is, is, is primarily to get us thinking about what are our break-even costs? Uh, what, are, what is our break-even price point? But all, more importantly, what are our costs? Um, I mentioned, I, I probably failed to mention, but I, the dollar and 23 cents, I added in some animal health costs, but clearly providing feed and equipment costs of, of putting out the feed to those sheep. Here in Wyoming, many producers travel to their allotments. They have to haul the feed out there. Clearly, there's a labor fee there. Uh, there's some depreciation of that equipment, wear and tear of that. And so that's going to be different based on the operation. But providing those additional costs and accounting for those and knowing what price we, we may likely get in the August time point and what is forecasted can help us make some better decisions, especially in a year 
where some of our infrastructure has been pretty challenged in the sheep industry. Uh, you know, I, again, I realize that there's people from all over the country here, and so those of us not from the Mountain West in this scenario, we are very fortunate to utilize uh, dormant rangelands during the winter months with a high degree of diversity of both browse and, and, and cool season forages. Uh, our sheep do really well in those environments when we're not snowed out. Um, but really the quality of your, that basal feed ingredient is really an important component to calculating an accurate break-even price. Because if we overestimate the quality and the quantity on our winter range, we may be incorrect in our assumptions as to what our break-evens are. This, this table I provide here is, is some work in progress with one of my graduate students, Lexi Julian. And I, I show this just to show you that depending on the plant composition on your dormant range, the nutrient composition changes accordingly. Grass, generally speaking, cool season grass that has reached maturity has a, has a vastly lower crude protein content in addition to some of those trace mineral contents. That's the focal point of this study, more so looking at minerals. But we all know that crude protein is our most expensive feed input for the most part. And when we have a broad diversity of shrub species, we really provide a better uh, quantity of crude protein. And when we, we think about that in terms of those of us thinking about a low quality winter range for extending some of these lambs, especially later in the fall, I just provide two generic examples. Um, I, I provide some, some rough requirements of that 70 pound lamb in terms of intake, uh, grams of crude protein, energy required, and then the desired gain. And, and what out, outcome we may expect in a situation of a really high quality winter range and a low quality winter range. And for this particular example, the column that says low quality dormant grass only refers to kind of a monoculture of cool season grasses uh, without much shrub component. And you can see that uh, as we move down the list, it only meets about 33% of the protein requirement, 25% of the energy requirement. That is probably a scenario where we need to be thinking of a supplementation strategy. Uh, but, but just think about the basal component of the shrubs, and I think that's important, especially for our Wyoming producers that are listening, our Montana and other Western uh, sheep producing states. Look, look at the protein uh, obtained with having 50% shrubs and 50% grass. We're meeting 73% of that protein requirement and uh, uh, pretty similar energy um, obtained. But, but again, both of those are scenarios that, that probably aren't going to be um, feasible in all cases in terms of putting weight on those lambs or stringing them out. We may expect maintenance or a slow uh, plane of growth, but the reality is, is this should get us thinking about, one, what is our basal component, but two, what is our supplementation strategy? Um, the ability to extend these lands out, thinking about that, that lamb that we're trying to take to November, um, our, our goal is to utilize the least cost feed component, which is the standing forage in the pasture, uh, and not take away from sheep consuming that least cost ingredient. Oftentimes here in Wyoming, this winter especially, some of our prime sheep country um, in the southern corridor of the state have been snowed out. And so the quantity just wasn't even available. And so we had scenarios where producers were substituting the entire diet of these ewes instead of supplementing because the sheep didn't have any access to it. Many sheep were moved off of these ranges and put on cover crops alternatively. But, but it, it does beg the question, what, how are we looking forward uh, to the fall? Um, how would we look forward to sub supplementing these lambs if we were trying to string those out? And finally, I think it's really important, we've gotta be on top of our input costs more than ever. Not all supplements are created equal. All of them come at different price points and it's important for us to work through the math to see which one is the most cost effective when we put it on a cost per pound of nutrient, whether that be energy or crude protein. I just wanted to talk a little bit about, um, you know, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of anecdotes that circulate in an industry that has gotten smaller. Our larger animal industries have a vast amount of data reported and uh, there, there's a lot more information. And one of those anecdotes that I struggle with and, and wanted to t highlight just a little bit briefly is, is the science of extending lambs beyond that year of age and what it does. Uh, we did a study up at Montana State. We had some collaborators from Texas A&M to help us with the meat quality data. But our, the, the theory of our project with this was to look at older 
weathers, what we'd consider old crop weathers in our industry, uh, stringing those out on a low quality diet until later in the year and to see some of those sensory attributes. Our, our initial hypothesis is, hey, we've got these old Rambouillet weathers, surely they're gonna taste like mutton, right? Because that's all we ever hear. Oh, well, they'll break as mutton and they'll taste like mutton. Well, we took these Rambouillet weathers at about 18 months, we put them in a grow safe facility which quantifies feed intake, put them on some alternative diets with the hope of changing the flavor because we thought we'd be starting with mutton flavor with 18 month old Rambouillet weathers. Uh, they started on feed at about 112 pounds and there was a couple of interesting aspects um, with this study that I think uh, are important for us to at least to think about some of our paradigms in the industry. Uh, the, the gain in those lambs in the first 20 days, again, coming off of a maintenance type diet, going to a higher energy diet, we achieved about uh, just shy of a pound per, uh, per head per day in terms of average daily gain. Clearly there was some compensatory growth as those animals made up uh, for, for the diet that they weren't getting previously. That average daily gain, we took those animals another 20 days out to harvest and uh, that, that average daily gain clearly plateaued as those animals reached their peak uh, harvest optimal point. But really what's interesting about this, um, there's some carcass traits, but all, 18, all of those weathers, I believe there was 40 something, uh, Dr. Murphy was the, the lead on this at Montana State, um, all of them broke as lambs. Uh, the ossification hadn't occurred and they all broke as lambs, but most importantly, uh, using a, a really good trained sensory panel from Texas A&M and looking at some other chemical composition of off flavors, um, we didn't find anything adverse about those 18 month old Rambouillet weathers. Now, there has been a lot of research that has looked at this. Um, this is one study. But it does, it does beg the question is, is how, are we, how are we, what are our paradigms in terms of extending out lambs? Uh, what are our discounts associated with those older lambs? Obviously, these are Rambouillet genetics, a uh, little later maturing. These weren't on very large Rambouillet ewes. Uh, these, these lambs were not out of huge Rambouillet ewes. Um, but it does beg that question. Um, Recently, when I traveled to New Zealand, I thought it was interesting. I thought we were the only lamb industry in the world that experienced seasonal issues. Maybe show some of my ignorance. But as we traveled down there um, on this, this delegation last spring, I thought it was interesting as we traveled to the Merino country, the South Island, um, one of the producers mentioned that they usually utilize some of those Merino weathers to, to wrap up the tail end of their seasonal harvest because those lambs are a little bit older they can extend those out longer and they'll still meet those lamb classification status um, in their, their industry. Uh, obviously, Rambouillet and Merino are, are pretty similar genetically, um, later maturing. Is this an opportunity for us to separate off those white-faced Rambouillet weathers, extend those out, maybe take our, our more uh, rapidly gaining smut-faced or crossbred sheep and put those uh, on hotter feet earlier on? It, it, it's, a, it's a thought. One other aspect that Bridger and I bounced around recently is, is the opportunity to market yearling replacement ewes in our, in our region. In the western U.S., uh, not many producers are exposing uh, ewe lambs to breed before a year of age. Most of uh, those producers are doing it uh, later on. But, but oftentimes, the lower cut of those ewe lambs are treated as such and marketed as feeder lambs. And, and in a year where we're, we're scrambling to, to find some additional revenue. This may provide an opportunity for producers in our region. I just put a couple of talking points in there. I'm gonna work through another break-even scenario. But, but I asked the question to those with this, this resource uh, of marketing replacement ewe lambs, if we have the pasture resources and some of the available labor, um, have you looked at it? Um, could it be a source of added revenue in a time of uncertainty? Um, Clearly, if you look at the blue solid line and the dotted line, 2018 and 19, sure don't make it easy to uh, predict when we would market those. But I think generally speaking, most of us, if we have the capabilities to lump those into our, uh, a separate band or, or manage those separately uh, through the winter months on a very low cost option, and then harvest the wool before we sell those, I think there's some opportunities. And I'll show you that here in this break even. And again, I will, provide the disclaimer, I'm not an economist, it's shown so far, uh, but I, I provide a similar feeding strategy of how we would maintain these ewe lambs. Um, again, we're looking at a scenario where 
rather than marketing these in August as feeder lambs, we take these through to May when we would expect historical uh, advantages in terms of prices uh, for these, these yearling ewes. Again, similar feed cost per head per day. Obviously, instead of the 92 days previously with the feeder weather example, we're going out to 273 days. As a result, um, I, you can see in the footnotes uh, some of the details on my, my assumptions there. But uh, obviously, for our Western producers, uh, we have to account for herder costs with this. Again, I just put the gross salary divided by uh, 1,000 lambs times nine months, and it gives us about $5.35 per head. That's all contained in that cost per head per 273. Now again, what's the cost of you driving out there to check those, those camps and to bring them supplies? What's the cost of administering a supplement out there on winter range? There's various costs that I can't account for here, but in this break even exercise that hopefully everyone will be doing more regularly um, that you can account for. Again, I assume a 10% death loss in this scenario. And in the first bullet point, the one that in each one of those feed categories, I, I assume that you didn't get the sheep shorn and you're not capitalizing on that wool revenue. The lower amount or the second bullet in each one of those is actually with the wool revenue. I just do some rough calculations. I'm, I'm not expecting these yearlings to shear much more than eight pounds. I know that's, that's uh, Conservative for some people, I'm assuming a, a $2 a pound grease price for the wool, and that knocks out 10 to $12 per head. So you can see if I was to use that winter range scenario where it's a really low input system, my break even, just to get those sheep to May, when I would expect to sell those, is approximately $114. Um, if I harvested the wool, I could knock off some of those and increase my margin a little bit and the break even would be $106 and so on throughout each scenario. If you look at the forecasted LMIC price, um, you know, for that feeder lamb uh, at that 70 pound weight, uh, that would be approximately uh, 100 bucks for that animal. Uh, historical prices, again, I have to allude to the fact that 2013 to 17, we had a really strong uh, yearling ewe market. Uh, it's backed off some in the past two years, and who knows what's it going to what's it's going to be this this coming year. But the point is, is is how do we value these resources? You put so much work into lambing those ewes, you put so much work into to, to managing your herders, and and you all know how hard you work for the product you produce. There's often times that I feel may we may be giving some of these away, and looking at these alternatives, uh, may be the difference between success and failure in a year as bad as this one has been so far. Just to summarize, and, and this, this summarizes what Bridger preached earlier, even in his market report, I think it goes without saying that this is a year where we have to be extremely proactive in our marketing strategy. It, it requires us going through these exercises before late summer and early fall. Um, it, it requires us to make those phone calls now. I know everybody's talking. I've, I've talked to many producer colleagues that I respect uh, in preparation for this webinar, and I realize that most people are talking, but sometimes these exercises, especially the economic exercises that are brutally honest, aren't always super comfortable to talk about sometimes, and it's important that we do those soon. I, I highlight the fact of knowing your numbers, and, and there's extension resources in your states that can help you get to the bottom of what your numbers are if you're not sure what they are, and, and they'll do so confidentially to help you um, accurately estimate what that would be for a break-even analysis. But more importantly, it's really important to look to objective sources, such as the Livestock Marketing Information Center. I think those prices are reported by the USDA. They're not the land buyer's prices. Uh, obviously, there's other things going on in the industry, but the point is, is it's an objective source of pricing data that sometimes provides you a, a better negotiating platform. I think this goes without saying, but many of our grazing resources are pretty tied up. I know that there's not a plethora of, of open land out there, but this is a year to reach out to, to our contacts in other states, uh, throughout our states to, to find some grazing options. If we're thinking of trying to extend some of these feeder lambs, uh, background these feeder lambs, and also extend some yearling ewes out and capitalizing on that revenue. Uh, a big assumption that clearly I didn't go into a ton of depth is, is what is our predator loss? Um, you saw the increase in break-even prices when we added in 10% death loss. There's many of us that have experienced more than that. 
And if there's a year to be in contact with our trappers, to be on top of our, our, our guard dog management, this is definitely one of those years. Because if we don't account for our predator loss, especially in, in the Western US, we have a, don't have a great footing to stand on in terms of a break-even analysis. Um, something else to think about, and we've seen this as we've sampled uh, dormant just throughout for our studies. Initially, sheep, given the selective nature of their grazing behavior, are gonna defoliate the best parts of those plants early on. So they're gonna spend the first 20 to 30 days just picking the best, their gains are gonna be great. But if we're trying to prolong um, uh, for a longer period of time, trying to string out those lambs, we need to account for both the decline in quantity and quality of the forage that's available, especially on cool season rangelands in, in Wyoming. Uh, Bridger alluded to this, and again, I'd highlight in years other than this year, we would expect a 5% increase in feeder lamb prices based off that three market average. Uh, from LMIC. From August to November, it's about 5%. August to fe February, it's about 23.8%. Uh, you know, I've got this question as I've talked to, to friends and colleagues is, is boy, if you, if you string out lambs, you're going to get an old crop discount. And, and I question the, the logic of that sometimes, especially from flocks in Wyoming that do lamb in May and June. If we're selling them in February, should we be getting an old crop discount? especially considering, considering the compensatory gain that they're going to have when we put them on a better feed. Uh, and I, I mentioned that scenario from New Zealand because that, that does ring in my mind a little bit. Is as an industry, we've been talking about seasonality, and there's various ways to get around that in different parts of the country. But here in Wyoming, we just don't have the feed resources to change our lambing season. We may turn out bucks a little later to have lambs later in the year, but the reality is is the it's our whole industry's responsibility to deal with some of these seasonality issues. And oftentimes there is an economic incentive. Sometimes there may not be. But looking at other countries and what they've done, perhaps separating our white face weather, some of our fine wool weathers, stringing those out a little bit longer as they're later maturing uh, might help um, extend some of the bottlenecks and processing. I, I'd leave you with these words, as, and uh, I want to be clear that all of us, uh, are aware of the, the challenges that, that our, our producers are facing. And um, I use this as a thought provoking um, commentary and not, not to point fingers. I think we just as an industry steeped in tradition, I, I love this quote that remember the six most expensive words in business are, we've always done it that way. And um, this is a year where we can't afford to always do it the same way. And with that, I think we can roll into some, some Q and A. Um, uh, Bridger, I will ask for your help with this as well, but we have some panelists available uh, to answer some of these questions. Um, we may deflect questions to those that may have better answers. Um, all economic questions, I'm going to defer to other people. If you have questions on management or the break-even scenarios I presented, I'm happy to, to work through some of those. We're also, we're grateful for some of our industry representatives that have been working extremely hard for our industry. Uh, in Washington, and uh, would ask that, that you'd be cordial and um, concise in the questions that you ask. So with that, um, Caitlin, you can also help me with questions if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I was I just looking at the chat box here. You have a couple that came in early um, that says, does the U.S. lamb and mutton consumption include import numbers as well as American lamb? Yes. So that's that's just lamb consumption um, in aggregate. And then we see one here is the increase in slaughter in quarter three and four likely to be those lambs that have been held back. I think so. Do you want to take that one, Caitlin? Am I unmuted? There you are. Okay, great. Um, so yes, yeah, so this assumes that some lambs are going to be held back are going to be held back and pushed to that third and fourth quarter. Um, the big drop you see in Q2, some of that is pushing slaughter around a little bit, but remember, it's um, compared to a year ago, we had a huge increase in slaughter in the second quarter in 2019, and so some of the big decrease in that quarter is just where Easter fell.
Please remember, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. Bridger and Caitlin and, and Dr. Anderson, you might comment, you know, some of the data that we present, is there a lag time? Obviously our feedlot inventory, we're gonna see a pretty big jump next report. I mean, is that, what is the lag time on some of the data that was presented um, this evening? Uh, this is Caitlin. It really depends on what you're asking about. Um, so we're going to get the next month's worth of um, export data here next week. Um, slaughter data on a weekly basis is going to be delayed two weeks. Um, the lamb on feed report, maybe David knows that off the top of his head. I don't know when the next one of that is. You know what? I don't remember either off the top of my head. Sorry about that. Um, but and of course, you know, the trade like, data, you know, the trade data, we, it comes out, uh, you know, we're a good six weeks behind roughly. Cold storage, you're a month behind. And a lot of it's just, there's so much information out there from so many different places that you got to synthesize and get it together in order to make it um, something that makes sense to the industry in, a, in an aggregate form. Uh, Dan Macon, are you on by chance? Dan, if you were on, and I thought I saw you on earlier, if you have a chance to just comment on how uh, outside of the box valuing of, of uh, some of these, these feeder lambs and ewes is being utilized for targeted grazing back in, in your neck of the woods. I know that's a bit off topic, but um, I, I may be talking to no one if you're not on. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm on. I'm on. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think I think one of the interesting things maybe out here on in California is the huge demand for grazing, particularly from about this time of year through um, July, August. And I think one of the challenges is, is as we go later in the year, it's not particularly strong feed, but there is perhaps another way to, to get some value from those mouths in terms of getting them paid for grazing projects. And, and that may be something to look at um, in a more regional basis too. Um, we, we could use a lot more sheep in California for, for the fire season than we've got available to us. Wait, can you Thank see you the chat box there? What, what's that? I was asking Whit if he can see the chat box. can now oh boy okay. all right there's a few in there for you all right so uh working down the list there um from trina i have hair sheep here in wyoming is there a preferred market for those in the area uh, i'll take a stab at it and then if, if someone else wants to chime in you know traditionally as a fit in the commodity system at least currently you know that lighter carcass um isn't the perfect fit, but in terms of, of non-traditional markets, I think hair sheep have a tremendous amount of, of versatility. I think uh, A&M has done some really good market outlooks recently and have showed that the non-traditional market or those destined for non-commodity outlets uh, have, have been pretty resilient so far. Uh, is, that, is that your take, Dr. Anderson? Yeah, they have been. They, they've tended to be so if, if we look at San Angelo and a lot of our lambs, there are hair sheep and a lot are destined for non-traditional markets. And they do, they, we have been running higher prices for those uh, essentially lighter weight lambs that are, would be going to that market uh, have been, have generally tended to have a little higher price than the others. Excellent. So, so long story short, I think there is tremendous opportunity. I think, we are pretty far removed from some of those larger outlets. I mean, Centennial is one. Um, there's some other smaller ethnic markets out there. And I think timing and figuring out timing is, is probably the best uh, strategy for, for maximizing um, production of those types of sheep in this region. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, would breeding open ewes or maybe larger 2019 born ewe lambs and marketing them help increase some value? and otherwise unproductive ewes. Um, you know, some operations, uh, Tom, they are exposing all of the ewe lambs and then checking those that don't take 
they're, they're either going to extend for the following year or market those as feeder lambs. So that is be do, being done to some extent. And that's a really uh, important management strategy to look at is exposing those ewe lambs, determining if they're pregnant and, and moving on. Anyone else want to address that? All right. Next question. Um, with, when you figure your break even with the ewes on range, what are you pricing your lambs to yourself when you start your study? Um, so this particular scenario uh, wasn't necessarily a, a study here, but I, I used the break even price as to what I would get if I marketed them at that August time point. And so as we go back um, for the feeder lamb example, stringing them out 90 days, um, depending whether it's a good average or high year, however optimistic I am, I use those LMIC uh, feeder lamb, 60 to 90 pound feeder lamb prices. And so on that screen, um, I can share that with you. Um, and I will share that with you because we need to talk after this, uh, Henry. So uh, yeah. But yeah, I'm using the, the projected price of what it would bring in August. So yeah, I, I think what, if, if, you were going to do that analysis, Henry, or or someone else is looking at doing that analysis. Come uh, fall, you charge those. You're you're figuring, you know, that market current market price is what you're charging yourself for for those lambs, and comparing that against a potential future price, given your change in expenses and costs. So, it's that current market price that you're going to use. So. Uh, comment um, about wool sheep in San Angelo are currently bringing more than hair lambs. Um, you know, I'm, that may be the case. I'm, I'm not, I don't follow that market as closely. I think, um, yeah, that might be a question for, for Dr. Anderson. Is that, is that what you have seen, Dr. Anderson? That, yeah, that, uh, I was just typing a response in there. I didn't know if you'd want to take that or not, but I, uh, I was just typing in there that, that, you know, when you try to split out that data between the two, it's pretty often that they they cross back and forth, you know, from week to week or over several weeks. And, and some that are destined for the non-traditional market, uh, you know, there are times that those are higher than the others. But there is, there is quite a bit of movement in prices uh, when you try to split out that data. So uh, thanks for calling on that one. I thought that was a good comment. And I'll delete my typing. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Anderson. Uh, so clarification on that exposing of ewe lambs, I guess the question was more so um, if, if we exposed ewes uh, in the spring for fall lambing, would that work? You know, I'm not aware of a, a study done in our region to that effect, but, but obviously that would be an opportunity um, is exposing those, especially if it's a a pretty a-seasonal breed or a breed that will have some success at conception like uh, some of our, our Rambouillet may have in this time of the year. Uh, that may be an opportunity. Um, you know, our larger range bands probably aren't set up to manage a, a fall lambing group uh, necessarily, but that's outside of the box. That, that might be another opportunity. So thank you for mentioning that. We, you have a couple of questions that are actually farther up the chat line that I think got lost up in there. Um, All right. Uh, I'm not, Caitlin, you go ahead and ask those. I'm having a hard time. Let's see, I see one, um, some comments. The continued rain in Australia has been has seen restockers competing with exporters for lambs while our commercial lamb supply chain is being impacted. Light lambs and goat kids under 60 pounds are hot in Texas now with them being exported to Mexico for processing. Um, lambs on feed report comes out the first of every month. I think those are mostly just comments. Okay. 
you know, one thing I, I should mention, I want to acknowledge our industry partners that, that helped in, in some of these, um, these estimations of prices. I also want to uh, recognize Lisa Eidman. I'm going to put her on the spot. She, she helped provide me with some, some data that I was struggling to find. Um, if there's any private industry that wants to provide a, a brief perspective or just a, a take home message before we log off, I, we'd more than welcome it. Lisa, I was kind of putting you on the spot there, and now I'm really putting you on the spot, but. Uh... I can give some wrap up comments if Lisa's not ready yet. Yes, yes, okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, um, you know, thank you guys for having me. Um, I learned a lot actually listening to this presentation. Um, you got some great resources up in, the, up in Wyoming. Um, one thing I would say is these markets are changing very, very fast. Um, we cover all the livestock species and, um, you know, they're all facing their own challenges. Some of them are the same related to slaughter capacity. Some of them are a little different. Um, and there's just a lot of moving parts, which makes it difficult to see um, with any kind of real certainty around some of these issues. Um, you know, we put out a forecast on a quarterly basis, which you know, many of you are trying to market within much shorter time frames than that. And so, you know, I don't, I don't envy you, um, but I will say we're updating these as oft, much more frequently than we normally would. And it's to reflect that great uncertainty in the market. And it's not just, um, you know, a slaughter issue. It's not just a COVID issue. It's the repercussions that are going to come from all of that. Um, you're going to be competing in the meat case with other animal proteins that have an enormous amount of production coming onto the market. Um, and they too are having slaughter capacity issues. But as the US consumer starts to look at their wallet, what their certainty about their jobs are, um, income moving forward, that's gonna be a much different competition between all the competing meats moving forward. Um, I would just say, you know, there's a lot of risk in here and it's gonna be very difficult to have any sort of certainty moving forward until we get through some of these public health hurdles. But even then, you know, the issues with slaughter plants and how do you have um, public health coincide with those types of arrangements where you do need to work pretty close together, um, that might have farther reaching implications than even just this quarter, next quarter, et cetera. Um, so just some things to think about in the bigger picture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, any other comments from, from any of our industry partners that, that I've overlooked? Please feel free to share before we, we log off. I, I would mention there are some resources, and, and Caitlin, you're going to take back over here in a minute, but uh, I, I'd encourage you all to stay, stay closely connected to uh, your, your state industry organization. Um, and also, which is directly affiliated with ASI. Um, they're, again, I mentioned they're working hard to make sure that uh, we are included on, on uh, these programs that are being offered currently and that are in the rulemaking process. Um, but, and we'll, we'll share other resources. Uh, Texas A&M has been doing a every other week market update as well. And uh, we will link um, if you wanna get some context from when this started and some of those changes as well, we'll provide those. Um, also, but uh, we, we just appreciate everyone being here. You've got a Caitlin few more questions came in here, Whit. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, Wilson Renner's question's good. What advice do you have for a young producer wanting to expand their operation during this time? I think, you know, definitely approach with some caution and it really depends on your risk tolerance. Like, you know, like Caitlin just told us, there's a lot of risk in, in the markets right now. Um, and so, you know, with risk comes opportunity at some, at, you know, in some ways um, for a young producer, but it's also a, a challenging time to be entering. Uh, so I would just, you know, give you a word of caution in terms of, of, you know, being able to sort of create a business plan around that and enter a market right now could be, could be pretty challenging for a younger producer. Mm -hmm. uh, not that there's not opportunities in risk, but but just be aware of that. 
Yeah, and also being able to crunch these numbers, Bridger. I think accessing some of these tools or if you're not comfortable doing it yourself, working with your extension resources, because these numbers don't lie. And, and obviously we love uh, our industry in producing sheep, but um, oftentimes the, the cold-hearted economic analysis is, is the most uh, successful strategy, I think. We've got one here about the break even on stretching the feeder lambs. Do you see that one, Whit? Yeah. Uh, so the break even on stretching, oh, let's move it. the break even on stretching the feeder lambs is interesting, but what would the finishing cost of gain be for the different groups? In other words, if you include the finishing phase, which would be the best system? So yeah, I, I didn't delve into that a whole lot. Again, I took the the approach of just hanging on to those lambs and letting somebody um, finish them for you. Again, that is the next step that we probably should play with those numbers. There is obviously value in, in marketing some of those fat lambs. You'll notice today that we didn't focus on the fat lamb market. Um, that would be cause for a, definitely an additional webinar, but uh, our strategies looked at just extending them as low cost as possible and then passing those on down the line. Um, Bridger, did you want to tackle that or? No, I think that's, that's accurate. Mm -hmm. um, a really good question here. And again, it's going to show my ignorance, but, but this, this does, this presents a scenario that we may see if we're trying to stretch out those ewe lambs. If the yearling ewe's price is headed down, at what point do you sell the ewe lamb and buy a yearling ewe that has a better chance of breeding and getting revenue sooner than keeping a ewe lamb? Um, you know, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, it depends on the situation at hand. I think, you know, breeding ewe lambs, we know it, it can be done. Obviously, we don't expect a 95% conception when we breed ewe lambs. I think given the feed resources that we have here in some of our western states, and the cost to get those ewe lambs um, up to weight on time is, is probably been a reason why we don't expo expose more ewe lambs uh, in the Western US. Uh, it can be done. I think it, it, it goes back to what you're set up for. Um, but in a year uh, like, it, like this, perhaps exposing those ewe lambs, which we're gonna be maintaining anyways as replacements until the following uh, breeding season, uh, maybe giving it a shot to see, but that, that is another really important break-even scenario. Clearly, there's some more that I need to run through here. Yeah, and I would just add, Whit, if you have some specific uh, scenarios like that that you're interested in looking at, you know, uh, go to the Wyoming Ranch Tools website. My contact information's there. Uh, you can get Whit's contact information as well. Uh, you know, give us a call. We're happy to work through those types of scenarios with you. Um, and show you how to use some of those tools to, to be able to make those decisions moving forward. All right. Yeah, a, a good comment. I um, A good comment. I don't have a microphone or video here, but I just wanted to say that the scientists and sheep crew here at USDA ARS Meat Animal Research Center and U.S. Sheep Experiment Station are certainly feeling the pinch of these times. We are continuing research here and supporting the industry. Great point. I, I, I think uh, now is a time that we really rely on our, our research infrastructure. And I, I, I agree with that 100%. You know, as we uh, are experiencing these, these setbacks, uh, your, your land grant institutions and your federal research institutions are still conducting research. And, and those programs have to continue, can continue our multi-year projects that, that are trying to answer your everyday production questions uh, are marching on. And um, I'll speak for, for those scientists, there's a, there's a high level of dedication in our industry to, to you as the producer. And so we hope this has been a value tonight. Um, Caitlin, any concluding thoughts? Bridger, any concluding thoughts? Uh, please do take a minute, if you would, to um, fill out the very, very short evaluation form. I posted a link there in the chat. You can just copy and paste it. It's a Google evaluation. It's very helpful to us. Um, and remember that we have that an, another program on Thursday, May 21st, same time at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. And it's the same Zoom link, and the topic will be on wool markets. 
um, and it will be really a conversation with, we'll be bringing several other um, industry, rep industry representatives and having a conversation about wool markets. So I hope you can join us. Excellent. All right, well, stay safe everyone and uh, thank you for your good work and producing good lamb and wool. Thank you all, have a lovely evening.